Harry Met, virtual traveller, and welcome to Stories from Law, a monthly podcast that invites you to rewild yourself through story by exploring nature, folklore, and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson, and I'm an author and professional storyteller. This month's theme is A Fish in the Net. And for this episode, I'm sharing with you a trip to the beach, the shanty of When the Boat Comes In, some selected folklore of fish, and the story of the fisherman and the fish. But first, join me on the beach as we search for shells. come to a beach called Me On Shore, which is mainly a shingly beach, but it's also got some sand, which is more like sort of mud flat, where you'd get lots and lots of uh, shorebirds. Opposite, it's Titchfield Haven, which is a nature reserve. From here, we can see across to Forley Power Station on one side. What a lovely sight that is. And then across, which is a bit nicer, well, definitely a lot nicer, because lots of little sailing boats and we can see cows on the Isle of Wight. Almost looks like we could stride across to it. <laughs> I'm pedaling in the water, so I could if I wanted to. What's it feel like? It's really cold. It's really cold, isn't it? Look at all the scenery. Look at all the different colours. Oh. Bright green. Yeah, it's Almost red, isn't it, some of it? Yeah. Oh. It's sort of a bit, isn't it? This is a big tree colour, it looks like, it looks like hair. All the shells. What kind of shells have we found today then? There's a periwinkle. Yeah. What else have we got? Cockle shells. Cockle shells. Ah, oh, that one's a whelk. Yeah. What's this one? Do you know what this one is? What does it look like? A um, little bit like maybe... Is it a slipper shell? Well done! That's a slipper shell, yes. I seem to remember because it looked, it looked a little bit like, like, like someone's foot could slot into it. It does, doesn't it? So that's how we know it's well, a slipper shell. No, it doesn't, Daddy! <laughs> we, have to, we have to catch slippers in the sea. That's obviously just a baby slipper. <laughs> That's not true. We, we found lots of those, haven't we? We found whole shells. Uh huh. That you that we open up to see if we can find anything that might be inside them. Yeah. And I found some seaweed. Ah, it is, isn't it? And what else did we find further at the beach? Can you remember? Uh, remember what they were? They were great big sort of dry balls of stuff, weren't they? They looked a bit like sponges. Oh, they were fish eggs. They were fish eggs, yeah. Oh, that one's got quite a bit of uh, erosion on it, hasn't it? But it's very pretty. Yes. You can actually put that on a necklace. I used to sing this song as a child, and I remembered it when I was researching this episode, but I have since discovered that the words in the original are somewhat different to the words that I sang when I was younger. Well, the reason for this will become apparent once I've sung the whole song, but it's a proper fisherman's shanty and talks of a love of the sea and, well, drink.
Ye shall have a fishy on a little dishy, ye shall have a fishy when the boat comes in. Come here, my little Jacky, now I've chowed my backy, let us have a cracky till the boat comes in. Dance to your daddy, my bonny laddie, dance to your daddy, to your mommy sing. Ye shall have a fishy on a little dishy, ye shall have a bloater when the boat comes in. Here's your mama coming, she's a cunning woman, yonder goes your daddy, drunk he canna stand. Dance to your daddy, my bonny laddie, dance to your daddy, to your mommy sing. Ye shall have a fishy on a little dishy, ye shall have a herring when the boat comes in. Tommy's always fuddling, he's so fond of ale, but he's good to me, I hope he doesn't fall. Dance to your daddy, my bonny laddie, dance to your daddy, to your mommy sing. Ye shall have a fishy on a little dishy, ye shall have a mackerel when the boat comes in. Like a drop myself when I can get it sly, I hope my bonny Ben will like it well as I. Dance to your daddy, my bonny laddie, dance to your daddy, to your mommy sing. Ye shall have a fishy on a little dishy, ye shall have a salmon when the boat comes in. Dance to your daddy, my bonny laddie, dance to your daddy, to your mommy sing. Dance to your daddy, my bonny laddie, dance to your daddy, to your mommy sing. There are plenty more fish in the sea, as the saying goes, and so for this episode, I will be looking at the folklore myths and legends of these fish. There are so very many species, around 33,000 to be precise, of fish in the sea that I have chosen to look at the ones that piqued my interest as I was researching this episode. In the UK, at least, in our everyday parlance, fish is commonplace. Examples are to fish for compliments, which speaks for itself, a fish out of water, which refers to someone who is perhaps uncomfortable with the task they have been given or the environment that they're in, something fishy, when talking about something that doesn't seem quite right, to fish troubled waters is used when referring to the habit of someone who benefits often from others' misfortunes. And finally, a big fish in a small pond, which is again self-explanatory. We are in this country well aware of the importance of fish in our oceans, but we often need to travel to other countries to find examples of where they are truly revered. Barbados is often referred to as the land of the flying fish, as this fish is native to their seas. The name flying fish is used to refer to over 60 different species of fish that can propel themselves out of the water and into the air, where they can travel for a distance before returning to the sea. The flying fish appears on their currency, as well as being the Barbados Tourism Authority's logo. If you visit Barbados, you will find that many restaurants there serve their national dish, which is a dish of flying fish. In the mists of Polynesia, the flying fish is greatly admired and respected for its abilities. In Hawaii, the flying fish is called the, and I'm sorry if I'm saying this wrong, the malolo. This word refers to a fickle person who leaps from mate to mate. There are nine species of flying fish native to Hawaii's shores. There are many stories and urban legends of these fish flying right onto the decks of fishing boats or colliding with fishermen's heads. Moving to Japan, where the indigenous people, the Ainu, believe that the trout bears the world on its back. The tides are caused by it sucking in and out the water as it breathes. If it does this very quickly, then this can result in tidal waves or tsunamis. If the trout shakes itself, then there is an earthquake and so the creator placed two gods at either end of the world trout to try and stop this from happening. In Irish folklore, there is an ancient white trout who is thought to have once been a lady whose lover was murdered. She was so grief-stricken, the fairies took pity on her and placed her in the lock, turning her into a white trout. This white trout appears in both American and Icelandic folklore. However, it's also said to be completely covered in fur. The legend is thought to have come from a cotton mould that sometimes grows on fish. In Iceland, the trout is the creation of a demon, and in Canada, the faux fur trout was created using white rabbit fur by a taxidermist named Ross C. Job of Salt St. Mary. Going back to Japan, 
Koi carp are associated with the samurai as they represent strength and perseverance. When they are caught, they lie still and accept their fate, as does the samurai, who fall on their sword. If you stop beside a well-stocked koi carp pond, it is said that it will bring you good luck, fortune, prosperity and longevity. In China, a legend tells of a koi carp that was swimming with its shoal up the river to a waterfall. They all began to swim up the waterfall when a demon intervened and made the waterfall taller and taller. The other fish gave up, but one koi persevered, and even though it took him a hundred years to swim up the waterfall, he succeeded, and the gods rewarded him by turning him into a golden dragon. On the subject of pond fish, the goldfish is often found hanging around with koi, and it became the subject of an experiment in 2009. For reasons known only to himself, Dr Reinhold Hilbig from Stuttgart sent 49 goldfish up in a plane to then see what happened when the plane went into a steep dive. He reported that eight of the fish, as they lost gravity in the dive, began swimming in circles. I'm not sure how much of a scientific discovery this is, because I think I might do that too if it ever happened to me. Returning to Britain, where I'm hoping the goldfish of our back garden ponds and aquariums are relatively safe from random free-falling pain experiments, let's take a look at the seas off our coasts. In this country, there are a big five that the British Sea Fishing website refers to. These are the top five fish we consume in this country. They are cod, haddock, tuna, salmon and prawns. These five make up potentially 75% of the seafood consumed in the UK, depending on which stats you are looking at. Fish is a favourite dish on a Friday in this country, mainly because of the Christian religion. This is still very much dominant in British culture and requires Christians to abstain from meat on a Friday. British Fish and Chips is renowned internationally and, well, for those who are not in the know, it consists of deep-fried battered fish of one sort or another, traditionally cod or haddock, with a side of chipped potatoes, again, deep-fried. There are other alternatives, battered sausage, cheese and onion fritters, deep-fried cod roe, mushy peas and much more, but either way, the queue still winds out the door each Friday at the local fish and chip shop. Religious or not, we are creatures of habit. Breverton's Book of Nautical Curiosities argues that the cod is the reason we set out across the Atlantic. In the Vikings' Icelandic sagas, they were recorded as eating cod on their expeditions to America, and this has remained a staple in our diet ever since. Cod's cousin, the haddock, can be identified by a black spot, a little like a thumbprint, which sits behind its head. These spots are referred to as Satan's thumb marks, or conversely, St Peter's marks. Well, I'll let you decide who grabbed the haddock and left those thumbprints there. Continuing the Christian theme running through fish, in the 17th century the mackerel was the only fish that could be sold on a Sunday. This was more to do with the fact that its shelf life is so very short and it goes off very quickly so it needs to be sold quickly. Hence they were sold off on a Sunday. There is now immense pressure on the big five stocks of these fish. In the last century, the populations of fish such as tuna, cod, swordfish and marlin have declined by 90%. Let me put this another way. Over the last hundred years, we've managed to get rid of 90% of these fish in the sea. Only 10% remains. Techniques such as long-line fishing kills not only excessive amounts of fish, but also 300,000 seabirds and 100,000 albatross each year. Trawling creates equally devastating effects, tearing up the seabed and destroying species caught as bycatch, such as anemones. Haddock are now close to extinction, and eel, tuna, plaice, hake, halibut, swordfish, flounder and shark are in desperate need of rebuilding their populations. So, next time you're in the fish and chip shop, or at the fish counter in the supermarket, perhaps consider the alternatives. These might be not fish at all, because to be honest, there are very few sustainable ways to eat fish left. But 
Fish that can cope at the moment are mackerel, rock, herring, pollock or dab. And like I say, it's now becoming increasingly more difficult to eat fish in a sustainable way due to the fact that we have depleted the stocks by so much, but also due to the insufficient sustainable fishing techniques. So if you're choosing to eat fish, spare a thought to where that little fishy on the dishy has come from, how it was caught, and whether there were sustainable methods. Did it incur bycatch? Did it employ methods that are not in line with the value, care and respect that we should show to the world that we live in? I don't want to turn this podcast into a conversation about the ethics of whether we eat meat or fish. But what I do want to do is to help people to reconnect with the nature that is around us so that we can come to live in a more balanced way. Those of you who love Celtic folklore may have noticed that I have not mentioned the magical salmon in this episode. I am well aware of this, and it's because I am planning to make the salmon the subject of an entire episode in season four of the podcast, and I think you'll agree it does need an episode all of its own. For now, I will tell you the story of a mythical golden fish, a story that hails from the Slavic traditions and is now found across the world, and this is my version of The Fisherman and the Fish. was a man who lived with his wife in a little cottage by the sea. He was very happy with his life, and he loved his wife very much. The cottage that they lived in was just the right size, and there were never really more than one or two holes in the roof, and they could patch them up easily enough when he got round to it. He went out each day to catch them fish for their dinner, and his wife would make a loaf of bread each day. Every day when he came back from fishing, she would complain that the only thing that they ate was fish and bread. Yes, he would say, but she could make fish pie, and she could make fish stew, and she could make a fillet of fish. She could fry it, bake it, roast it in the oven. However you cooked it, she said, it was still fish. Could they not just have a side of beef, just for a change? Or perhaps he could get some rice for them, and she could make rice pudding. Perhaps even some pork that she could make into sausages. But no, the fisherman liked it the way things were. Why would he take the trouble to walk the five miles to town and back when he could just walk the 200 yards down to the beach and catch them a fish? Besides, beef was expensive. Rice pudding was food for kings, not fishermen. And well, sausages, if she really wanted sausages, she could make them out of fish. But no, she did not want to do that. She acknowledged that the beef was expensive. And so then the conversation came around to the suggestion that perhaps he might like to go and get some extra work with the farmer to earn some more money, so that maybe just one day a month they could have beef, to which the fisherman argued that why would he want to work any harder than he already did? Conversations like this happened regularly, but nothing really changed over the years. The wife came up with grand plans to get them more money for the side of beef she dreamed of eating, and the fisherman was quite happy to go down to the beach each day and catch them two fish, gave them all the nourishment that they needed. After all, his mother has always told him, you never need to take more than you need. And so he never did. It was a particularly sunny day that day, when sitting on the shingled beach, the tide rushing in and out around his ankles, he felt the line twitch, and he reeled it in, quick as he had done every other day of his fishing life. But this day was different as on the end of the line he saw a golden scaled fish shimmering in the sunlight. Reaching out to grasp the fish tightly with his left hand, he dropped the rod which he held in his right and started to unhook the fish. Barb removed, he now held it out in front of him in the palms of his hands. This was a fine fish and it would feed them well, possibly for two days. Perhaps he could have tomorrow off fishing. He had never seen a fish like this and he wondered what it might taste like, hopefully as delicious as it looked. This would surely keep his wife quiet for a while, because these scales of gold, well, they could be made into fine jewellery, he thought. Swept up in his pride at such a catch, it took him a little while to realise that the fish was talking to him. "'Excuse me,' said the fish. "'Excuse me, kind sir.' 
Well, nobody had called him kind or sir for a very, very long time, and so the fish had his attention. Would you mind putting me back in the sea? It continued. Why would I do that? said the fisherman. You're a fine catch and you will feed as well. If you put me back in the sea, well, I can give you anything you wish for, said the fish. Ah, said the fisherman. Is that so? The fisherman thought for a while. Well then, he said, we may be able to strike a deal. I will let you go if you can magic me up a side of beef. The wife has been asking for one for years, and I know that would last us at least a week. I'd not have the need to come back down here fishing in that time. Your wish is granted, said the fish. When you return home, you will find your wife cooking a side of beef. And so it was that the fisherman returned the fish to the sea, and when he arrived through the door of his house, he found his wife was overjoyed with an enormous side of beef. She was indeed already cooking it, and she could do nothing but talk about it. How had it got to the table? How on earth had he got the money for it? It would last them a week, and now could he see how easy it was to get the beef, because he didn't need to go and catch those fish, really, did he? And the words just streamed out of her, until eventually she took a breath and allowed the fisherman to reply. When he was given a chance, the fisherman told her about the golden fish, and how he had wished for the side of beef, as he knew it would last them a week and would give her much joy. Her mouth fell open. You wished for a side of beef, she said. Yes, said the husband, smiling. A side of beef, the wife repeated. Well, yes, said the husband, a little less sure of himself now. A side of beef. You could have wished for a mansion, wished us out of this hovel without the holes in the roof. You could have wished for all the gold in the world so that we could eat beef every evening if we wanted to. But you, no, you wished for a side of beef. Yes, said the husband quietly, this time realising the opportunity he had literally let slip between his fingers. He did go out to fish the next day, but not because they needed the fish. It was because his wife, despite the beef supper they had enjoyed last night, was furious with him. He did not know how he was going to fix this one, and he always did his best thinking when he was fishing. So off he went down to the shingle beach again to fish. He cast his line and waited. It had been barely ten minutes. The sun had only just dragged itself out of the sea when the line began to dance. He reeled the line in, and you can imagine his surprise, utter delight and elation, when on the end of his hook was that golden fish. He unhooked the fish this time, and he held it so that they were face to face. Hello, fish, said the fisherman. A little foolish to end up on my hook again, don't you think? It was, said the fish, and of course you will put me back, will you not? Well, give me another wish, and I will, said the fisherman. Oh, I see, said the fish. The wife is not pleased with her side of beef, then. Not exactly, said the fisherman. Very well, you can have another wish, and then you must put me back in the sea. So the fisherman wished for exactly what his wife had asked for. He wished for a mansion with all the luxuries that she required and enough money so that they could buy beef for dinner every day if they wished. He then threw the fish back into the water and made his way back up the beach home. His wife came running out of the house, which was of course now a mansion, running down the beach towards him, shrieking, You caught the fish again! I did, said the husband. Well, now things continued very happily. The wife had enough money to buy the things that she wanted, and the husband, well, he didn't need to go down to the beach to get fish anymore. Instead, he spent his days playing cards with his friends in the local inn. But soon, the wife complained. She complained that when we had the cottage, people were often here asking for my advice, and I would listen to people when they wanted help with something. No one calls any more. And when I see them in the street, they are very polite, but they do not ask for my words of wisdom any more. They do not respect me. I should be respected. I am wise. I think it would be only fitting that I should be queen, the most powerful woman in the land, the woman that everybody looks to for advice. Well, the fisherman knew what was coming next. And so the next morning he took his fishing rod down off the wall and walked back down to the beach. He waited, and as luck would have it, he did not have to wait long, 
before he caught the golden fish again. Third time lucky, he thought. He told the fish of how his wife was not happy and that despite the riches in the mansion house, she felt that more people should pay her attention and that she would like to be queen. The fish agreed to grant this wish if he was thrown back into the water. This time the wife did not come running down the beach. Instead, when the fisherman turned around, there was a palace instead of the mansion. And when he walked in, he was attended to by servants. He found his wife sitting on the throne, surrounded by subjects who were all asking for her advice and showing her great reverence and respect. The fisherman smiled and returned to the inn where he played cards with his friends once more. This continued for many years until his wife again became frustrated. When she visited other countries in her capacity as queen, they did not really take her seriously, as she did not come from a long line of royals. They never asked for her advice. Instead, she now had a group of courtiers who gave her advice and foreign diplomacy wherever she went. Soon she started to talk of how she should be empress of the world, then people would respect her. Well, even if he was king now, the fisherman knew what was coming next – he would have to go back down to the beach and see if he could catch the golden fish again. The scene played out as it had done before, and he explained the situation to the golden fish. The fish agreed, if that's what your wife wants, she can have it, if you throw me back in the sea. And so the deal was done. When the fisherman turned around, he found a palace five times the size of the one he had left, and ten times as many servants, and, of course, an empress for a wife. She was very pleased that now the world would have to take her seriously and everyone would ask for her advice. Again, the life of luxury and perceived respect continued for many years until the wife, one day, overheard some of her ladies-in-waiting talking amongst themselves. I hear all her wealth and power comes from a magical fish. Did you ever hear such a thing? I hear she was only ever a fisherman's wife, another said. And I hear that the Emperor spends all his days playing cards in the local inn still because she's unbearable. The Empress went to bed that night, troubled by what she had heard. In an unsettled sleep, the golden fish appeared in her dream. It told her that it had given her everything she could possibly wish for. But if she was still not happy, she could be granted just one more wish, but that she must be careful what it was that she wished for. She woke with a start when the sun had not yet risen. She lay listening to the gentle snoring of her husband, and she began to think of how happy she had been in that little house by the sea, eating fish each night for dinner. Yes, she had longed for a change, something a little bit different for dinner, but she hadn't really wanted all of this. The routine had been comforting. Her husband was no more than a few hundred yards away at the bottom of the beach, never in an inn, and she could hear the waves of the sea in that little cottage too. She couldn't hear them in this palace. She had solitude and space to think in that little cottage. She had solitude now, but there were people all around her always wanting something, and it had become exhausting. With her husband still sleeping, she went and found the fishing rod, which still hung on a wall in roughly the same place as it had in the cottage. She walked out of the palace and down to the beach. She cast the line and waited. The sun was just beginning to creep up over the horizon and spread its yoky yellows into the sea when the line pulled tight and she reeled in the golden fish. Despite everything she'd been told by her husband, it was still a glorious thing to behold, and she stood there for a while taking it all in, holding it in her two hands, feeling its weight and its majesty. Fish, she said. You have shown me what it is to have everything I could possibly wish for, and I thank you for that. But I now understand that it is nothing compared to the true happiness that I once found in our little house by the sea. And do you wish for that little house once more, said the fish. I do, replied the fisherman's wife. And with that, and with that she let the fish slide back out of her hands and into the sea. It pushed its head above the waves and shouted, It is done. The fisherman awoke to cold morning air on his face, and when he opened his eyes and looked up, it was the hole in the roof of the old house which he had not yet fixed. 
He rubbed his eyes and sat up in time to see his wife in her old tatty frock and apron walking up the path to the house with the fishing rod over her shoulders and two silver herrings in her hand. Darlings of the sea. He smiled. Fish for dinner then, he shouted from the bedroom as his wife came through the door. Fish for dinner, she replied. Thanks for listening and for joining me beneath the waves with the fish of our oceans for the last episode of this season. Over on my Patreon this month, amongst other things, there is an e-zine packed with fishy info, folklore and stories associated with the ocean's deep. And there is a mindful moment for well-being in which we run with the hair woman of the meadows. In the audio track, available on the ranger tier and up, I have reimagined Isabel Gowdy's famous confession in her 17th century witchcraft trial – and created a shape-shifting fifth fath or incantation. You can find the link to join my Patreon Rewild Yourself Sue story in the show notes, and I do hope you'll join me there. I also hope you've enjoyed this season three of the podcast, and I'm already planning the episodes for season four, which I will return in July with. Thank you to everybody that has already reviewed this podcast. If you are able to, please leave me a review either on Apple iTunes or via my Facebook page. Both are very welcome and really help me to grow the audience for this podcast. As always, you can find me on Instagram as dd underscore storyteller, on Facebook as dd storyteller, and on Twitter as dd underscore storyteller. I hope to see you there, as I would love to tell you another story. Until then, I'll see you next time. Toodle pip! <laughs>